think that was sufficiently dramatic enough? Yeah, we were going for, for, for big here, you know, so. Blockbuster, we have to stop meeting like this, Colin. This is uh, probably like a third or fourth time we've done this in as many years. Absolutely, well, you know. Robots are uh, changing every year. So I actually want to give a, a little uh, kind of a brief history on the company because I don't think people quite understand how far back iRobot goes. Is it 28 years at this point? 28 years. So iRobot, Colin co-founded iRobot in 1990 with a couple of other people. I'm not sure what they've been up to since then. They've been keeping busy with uh, two fellow MIT grads. They went through a lot of iterations in the early days. If you've ever been to their offices in Bedford, you can see the museum. There's baby dolls. There's uh, military robots. What are some of the stranger things you guys were working on in those days? Well, you know, our, our first business model was actually a private mission to the moon funded by potentially the movie rights. So that, was the, that was the idea. So we were working on micro rovers uh, way back in 1990, which actually led to the Sojourner rover. Uh, and uh, my name's up on Mars, but um, that really wasn't a very good business model, and, and um, we went through. There aren't that many missions. Yeah, you can to the like, moon. have a good day, and then followed by a lot of. Sure. Then in 20 years, you can come up with the next one. There you go. Um, but so that was interesting. Uh, certainly, our foray into toys was 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 uh, ultimately incredibly important for the development of the company. But again, not a great business model. Um, we did uh, actually tried physical video games back a, a long time what is, ago. What does that mean, physical video game? So instead of having a screen, you have robots yeah. <laughs> that you can control and drive, like like do do it yourself, battle bots uh, in a cage in front. It was cool, but... Not, but, not but obviously, in the intervening 28 years or so, you figured out a business model that worked pretty well for the company. The first yes. Roomba came out in 2002, and um, as you've joked a few times since then, you finally became successful when you became a, a vacuum salesman. <laughs> well, absolutely, and, and um, I'm, I'm super excited to be here today because uh, we're announcing... The new Roomba. Yeah, so uh, again, you know, the, the, the last three or four times we've spoken, I feel like you've really, you've been a little cagey with me, you've been a little abstract, you've kind of been talking around the product, you've discussed the importance of, of the smart home and connectivity, we saw the, uh, the, the 900 series come out that could do mapping, but I feel like you're finally ready to actually be straight with me. Yeah, I mean, it's, you're more right than you know. I mean, I, I've, I've been talking about uh, the vision of where we're going. I've been talking about uh, what the technology could do. And today, you know, it's, here it is. This is the technology. It's, it's, it's no longer uh, thoughts and, and promises. It's, it's, it's instantiated in a real product. Yeah, I, you know, maybe maybe not like this the most dramatic reveal in the world because you know at its base you it really like is that? still. <laughs> I was pretty, you know. <laughs> we got to have robots to that next time. But I mean, at its base, it, it it is it is a Roomba. It looks it looks very similar mm -hmm. to the previous generation. Um, from a, a, a purely technological standpoint, what what's different about this one? So there's there's two huge differences. Um, the first is is this uh, clean base, and um, uh, <clears throat> what it does is. It, allows the robot to empty itself. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. And the other is the imprint mapping technology, which allows the robot to actually learn and remember information about the, the home it's cleaning so it can do it more simply, more easily. What's been interesting to me to watch since the news broke um, several hours ago is, you know, who... Who jumps on which portion of this device? You know, we covered it from the standpoint of this mapping and what that means to the future. I, I'm sure that I was um, influenced. You're in the mi minority. Okay, uh, and and most people have been talking about about this this clean base right here. So this is the fact that um, what. 30 times, every 30 times or so, you actually have to empty that? Right. So, uh, you know, I can give you a little little demo. I mean, the, the ideal Roomba is the one, at least in my mind, you never see and you never touch and you just come home and every day it does exactly what you want it to do uh, without your intervention and you have clean floors forever. And there's a couple things that, that stood in the way of that vision being realized and... Here we are with the i7. Um, 
knocking them down. So uh, <clears throat> no one wants to empty the dustbin. In fact, emptying a dustbin over the, the, uh, uh, the trash barrel sometimes unleashes a, uh, a dust storm of, of emptying and, and uh, what it's it's kind of it's kind of that irony of like having to wash the dishes before you put them in the dishwasher. Yeah. This is supposed to, you know, break down the d difficulty of doing that, but there's still an extra step in the process. You actually have to clean the robot that's cleaning your place. Right. And so uh, every time the robot comes back, it um, uh, well, I'll show you the um, uh, the. Uh, There's a, a very powerful vacuum which takes the contents of the dustbin and sucks it into a sealed bag inside, uh, uh, inside this base. And uh, it's not a subtle thing. We're actually compacting. So we have 30 full dustbins in this rather small um, uh, clean base. And so if you do the math on it and say, OK, well, if I filled the dustbin completely every day, well, that's, that's a month. Or if you're like me and you fill the dustbin every week or two, that's six months to a year between having to go and empty this, uh, this space. And when you're done, um, you just pull the soffit on it. It closes, you throw it out, and you're done. So uh, this is a huge improvement in the promise because you don't have to touch it for, for at weeks, months, uh, almost a year at a time. So I suspect that you as a company are moving to a fully automated process, right? That's ultimately the goal here? Right. And, and so the idea is, okay, we've, we've um, made the robot maintenance-free with our proprietary um, debris extractors, the rubber brushes on the bottom, so you don't have to clean the brushes. Now we automatically empty the bin, so uh, at least weeks at a time, uh, you, you can go without ever having to interact with the robot. And then the question is, okay, well, how do I make sure that the robot does exactly what I want it to do? And that's what this imprint mapping is about. It's a little bit more, um, it's a little bit more abstract. I mean, I think the reason why I thought that was more interesting of the two updates here is because uh, you're essentially turning the device into a platform, right? You've created the underlying technology. This is something that you've been working for for some time. We're going to see some fruits of that when the device is actually released. And it's a little bit more like releasing a smartphone than it had been in the past, right? Yes. So, you know, this robot has many times the processing power, orders of, an order of magnitude more processing power, actually uh, 30, 40 times the processing power. It's, it's basically a cell phone class mm -hmm. microprocessor running uh, inside this robot. And maybe I'll, given the audience, I'll, I'll give a little bit of, of uh, technical uh, detail as to how That's it why works. Here. So this imprint mapping technology has three main components. The first is a, a third generation V-SLAM engine, which allows the robot, as it moves around the environment, to go and create a map, and then as the robot continues to go out in multiple runs, improve the map so that if you move the couch or you uh, open a door that was closed last time the robot goes out, the map can evolve and, and stay current. So, so V-SLAM, for like my parents who are in the audience right now, it's Visuals, visualization Visual and simultaneous localization and mapping. So it's the, the, the core mapping engine. And the second is um, a, um, a visual landmark um, system which creates landmarks in your home which can be recognized regardless of the lighting conditions in the home. And so that's a Sounds hard, it is hard. In, in order to essentially know where it is at any given time? Right, so if I can see one, yeah. two, three landmarks, triangulate down, boom, I know where I am. And if I can do that in different lighting conditions, then the robot can operate uh, at any time of the day and not get lost. How do you correct for the fact, though, you know, I mean, it's, it, it's not, you know, it's not San Francisco, it's not New York City, it's not, you know, it's not the Trans-American building and the Golden Gate that you're using to triangulate it. It's somebody's house. So tables are moving, chairs are moving, people right. rearrange all the time. Right. So, you know, we, we go and we look up at, at the upper half of the walls. We find pictures, windowsills, things like that. It's scanning everything. It's, it's looking for things that uh, it can recognize in a variety of lighting conditions and 
it works really well. And one of the magic about this second, this second feature is that I can take this robot, put it anywhere in the home, and nearly instantly it knows where it is. So it, it can't get lost. And that's critically important because this imprint technology is a foundation on which we build all sorts of new cool stuff. So, you know, I mean, at least in the past, I, I think it's sort of, it knows where the dock is. So it knows, you know, it can use that to return to the dock. Why is it, why is it important that this knows what the kitchen is and what the living room is? Okay, so I haven't gotten there yet. Okay. So, so a little bit of, uh, bear with me a second. And then the, um, uh, the third um, dimension is that information that you place on that map actually is correlated down to um, sort of the, the shape of the home. And if you open a door and the map changes, all of that information mm -hmm. stays registered. And so that's this imprint engine. On top of it, I can build apps. And the first app that comes with a robot that we've developed is this home segmentation, room segmentation, and labeling. So you send the Roomba out, it goes and builds a map, and now it says, okay, I, I made this map of your home, and here's where I think the rooms are. And you say, well, did I get it right? If so, just label the rooms. If you want to go change some boundaries, uh, you can go and change those boundaries. When you say it knows where the rooms are, you mean it just, it, it, it knows sort of the, you know, it's like semi-superficial differences, like walls, what the, the, the barriers that separate one room from another and the there, general there, layout. Yeah, there's an AI that knows home layouts and what typically mm -hmm. represents a, a boundary between rooms so that it's probably 80, 90% right on its own, so you're not starting from scratch. You just have to tweak it here, and then you say, well, this is the den, this is the kitchen, this is the, a bathroom, and you have a map. So there, there, there's, there's some user set up initially when you get this home. Right, because we don't know what you call your rooms. Mm -hmm. I mean, some people could call a living room a den or a playroom, and we want to make sure we use the language that you use. And there are some things where, you know, you could have a big room, that's a square, and yet you think it's two rooms, and so the sure. robot's not smart enough to know that. You have to tell it. I live in New York City, and we you know, consider everything a room because we don't have a lot of space out there. Is it, is it generally able to distinguish, though, um, on its own? Does it have a base level knowledge that it can tell the difference between you know, a kitchen and a living room? Does it know um, what landmarks constitute a kitchen? Uh, not at launch. So that, you know, this, this is, as you said, a platform. And so we download and uh, updates all the time. And, and what the robot does at launch um, is kind of, you know, equivalent to what your iPhone did the first time you bought it. And then over time, it got smarter and smarter and, and could do more things. Well, we have the same kind of opportunity here. And so uh, you get the robot, you run it, it tells you what the rooms are. You, now you know what the names of the rooms are. And then you can use that information. So suddenly you can say, uh, OK, Google, clean the kitchen and the right thing happens. So this directed room cleaning is, is uh, a new thing that we can do. And in fact, we had to go work with uh, you know, the smart speaker guys to say, OK, um, we, you now have a, uh, a customer who wants to work with you, iRobot, that wants to tell you about rooms. This is very, very important because if I can tell you about rooms, then your smart speaker can be a lot more useful because you can say things like, uh, you know, clean the kitchen. Uh, and so that, that's huge. And then the other thing that it, it is maybe cooler to me is that I hate it when the Roomba goes out and cleans half a room and then cleans half of another room and then half another room because it doesn't actually understand or remember the full layout of the home. And now since we know what rooms are, Roomba can clean the kitchen completely and then clean the next room and never have to go back. And that substantially improves the efficiency of the robot. So we can put more battery power into cleaning dirt, less driving around. I, I'm, I'm glad you brought up smart assistants. Um, obviously, Alexa and Google Home, Google Assistant are, are a big part of this. Um, when we, we did a briefing for this, I went, I visited you in Massachusetts and we yep. looked at this early on and, you know, obviously you were very excited to show it to me and to show it to everyone here today. And you said something along the lines of this was the, the Roomba that you would always want to create. 
Um, and I'm wondering, when you're working with such a long runway, when you're working with these technologies and, you know, in some cases kind of waiting for the technologies to catch up with you, um, and then Siri comes along, and then the Amazon Echo comes along, how much does that change your vision of the product? How much of an impact does the explosion in connected home and smart speakers have on a, a device like this? Well, I think that the, uh, it accelerates the rate of change. It means that we can do more things. And so, um, you know, before we jump into smart homes, I could show the sure. video. Can yeah. we bring up that, that video of um, this navigation system uh, in action? Okay, so uh, here you have on the on the um, your left side of the of the screen, um, obviously an iPhone app uh, with a big clean button, uh, and to the right you can see what the the imprint maps look like, and you can see that um, we've this this home is divided into uh, different rooms. Uh, the user of this uh, robot has named the rooms, and you you can see those names. And then if we roll the tape. Um, just uh, go forward. You can see what the new interface actually will do. So you click the clean button by four. You did before, but suddenly you can choose the rooms you want to clean. Um, here is the list of the rooms on the first floor. You say clean the living room, and off it goes. This is the uh, what is it? F the the four thousand square foot. This is testing the iRobot space. home test lab. When when I went and visited you in Massachusetts, you have you have an entire. I mean, it's, it's probably four or five times the size of my apartment. A big fake home set up in the offices. Uh, with stylish furniture. <laughs> you didn't mention that. No. They, yes. So you know we do huge and extensive testing on all of these, um, but you could see it 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 went out. I said clean the living room. It drove to the living room, cleaned, and came back based on this uh, imprint technology. Um, and so uh, this understanding of the home that you just um, uh, enabled because of your, your Roomba um, is the foundation for doing a lot more things. And you started mm -hmm. talking about um, Alexa and the, the larger smart home. Uh, and I think that uh, it, one of the challenges with smart, home, smart homes today is uh, we as occupants of homes think about our house in terms of rooms and spaces. Uh, I go into the den, I turn on the lights in the den, I turn on the TV in the den, I, I might adjust the, the temperature to make it comfortable, uh, and yet our devices that we put into the home, unless we're uh, very diligent about programming them, have no idea where they are. In fact, uh, the homes don't have any idea of what a space is. And so how can you be magically useful without knowing what a room is, right? Because what's supposed to happen is you walk into a room and it just does the right thing. And if I say, uh, Alexa, turn on the TV, the right TV is supposed to turn on. If I say, okay, Google, turn on the lights in the kitchen, the right lights are supposed to turn on. And that's very difficult to do today without explicit user programming. And the type of technology we're showing on the i7 can actually provide that type of information if, as a user of Roomba, you want it to. It's interesting. I mean, you know, we're talking about sort of set it and forget it technologies in some of these cases. You know, you, you take it out of the box and you determine what each room is, and then, you know, hopefully you as an end user never have to worry about what the room is. Um, if one of the key selling points to this, at least down the road, is that it's going to be this kind of connected tissue for the smart home and determine where all these devices are. I mean, isn't that something where it just sort of goes out that first time, it maps the house, it finds out where everything is, and then you're kind of good from there? Or do you need a product that keeps patrolling your home? Well, if you are a, um, uh, actively try to manage your household today, your smart home today, um, then you've probably noticed that uh, about a week after you finally get it programmed and working right, you add something, or you move a light to a new place, or you move a couch, and suddenly the programming that you did or you hired someone to do to make your home work is wrong, 
or incomplete, and you get frustrated because you just got a device and it's not connected to that light. And when I push that light, all the lights but the one new one turn on, and that's frustrating. And so that this is a clear issue today, and it's only going to get worse because in the future, instead of 10 smart devices in our home, we're going to have 100 smart devices in the home. And who and what is going to manage that level of complexity? Um, your average consumer is, has not suddenly evolved from the consumer who never programmed their VCR. It has to be seamless. It has to be magical and just happen. And so that if simply by owning a modern vacuum cleaner, you get a smart home for free, so, so that's, that's something that, that's one of those updates that's going to come as an over-the-air update at some point? Yeah, I mean, I think that, again, this is a starting point. Yeah. The, all of this technology goes into making this a spectacular vacuum cleaning robot. When, when you talk about something like that, though, and again, it's something that you've been talking about for a while, is that something that we are definitely going to see as an update for this product that's on the stage right now? I, I mean, yes. In fact, the integration with other smart home um, uh, developers uh, is well underway. Mm. In fact, you know, we had to go and create um, relationships beyond fully arm's length in order to get the type of uh, room-based functionality that you're seeing today with um, uh, Google Home and Alexa, um, so that this, this partnership and development is, is moving along and uh, it works today. I do want to talk about those partnerships and we, we don't have a lot of time right now, but uh, early on in the early days, early days, a couple of years ago when he first started. Early days is 90s. Yeah. No, not even those early days. You know, a couple of years ago when he first started sort of touching upon this technology, yep. um, you were discussing partners. And obviously for something like this to work, you're going to have partners. You're going to have to have a, a you know, an, an Apple or a Google um, or, or an Amazon um, and all these other smart home devices. Now, one of the things that I think some raised some red flags for people was this idea of third-party companies, and you know that's especially important when you're talking about a product that's driving around somebody's house and mapping not, not only their home, but like where all of the really expensive things are in, in their home. So uh, first of all, um, is there any plan for iRobot to sell those maps to other companies? No, iRobot will not sell your data. Uh, in fact, uh, we have roots in defense, we have roots in uh, very high levels of security, um, we're, we're uh, GDPR compliant, and um, in fact, we go well beyond that in our approach to ensuring not just data privacy, but data security, and treat the data collected by the robot as your data. And so that if this data is going to be used for something other than making your Roomba work better, then you, the customer, are going to want to say, I want this new service and allow uh, some type of qualitative information to be shared. So, so there, there, there's an opt-in, and, and I guess we've got to hit this really quickly because we only have a little under a minute right now, but um, you know, there's a certain base level of security when it's on the device itself, but then you're sending it to a phone, and then you're sending it to a server, and then you're sending it to all these devices. So how do you ensure that that information is secure? Well, the, the type of information that leaves the robot is very qualitative, first off. It's not photos. It is... Um, it is uh, abstract, you know, you, you saw the type of information that is stored. So it's hardly where are the family jewels, it's squares and some text. So they can know at worst where the kitchen in your home is. Um, we encrypt everything on the robot so we never send information in the clear um, and so that it is not something that can be intercepted and then, um, uh, you know, both up and then off to the mobile device and so that we have many layers of, of protection and continuously uh, ensure that we are um, using state-of-the-art um, uh, crypto and, and uh, encoding uh, schema to uh, ensure that we are responsible guardians of the limited information that you have allowed the robot to take. Great, Colin, we're, we're out of time, but thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you.